times. But of course, we all know that geologists are a bunch of dumb people that just got a PhD in geology, and that uh, seven year old would understand how mountains are formed in 6,000 years. Um, that's the message that we're getting tonight um, over and over. Next question. Dr. McLeach, where is the empirical evidence for a chemist or physicist producing a living being from a non living being, i.e., spontaneous generation? Right. Okay. Um, before I answer that, let me get back to this recurring theme that has been brought up several times of the format of the debate. We agreed to the format of the debate weeks ago. Um, so that we wanted to, to change the debate uh, five minutes before we started. That is a little bit unfair. It's not exactly a fair tactic. That is why I said let's stick with the regional debate. Next time you want to do a point by point, I'll be very happy to do that. Now, the question was about oh, the origin of life from non life. As I said before, we don't have an answer to that. We don't know how life originated. We have some theories, we have some pretty good theories. Uh, we have scant empirical evidence, and there are a lot of people, bright people, uh, that are actually spending a lot of time working on it. Does that mean that uh, the evolution is, is wrong? No, it does not. As I said before, evolution is not to do with the origin of life. It also doesn't mean the science is wrong. I mean, people have to get out of this idea, which unfortunately is inculcated in their minds since by, by, by high school teaching, uh, that science is a body of knowledge that is absolutely complete, perfect. We know everything that, that has been done in, 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 in about the universe, and therefore we're just here to explain to you. Science is an ongoing dynamic process. We are learning things and we're trying to understand things as we go. As you asked a question like that about a century ago, for example, on uh, you know how do plants reproduce, uh, the answer would have been, I don't know. Because a century, about a century ago, nobody knew about pollen and nodules. Okay? Uh, about a century later, we do know. Uh, and you asked a question like this about 120 years ago or 150 years ago about what are genes, nobody would know even what you were talking about. Uh, nobody knew anything about the hereditary mechanisms and the hereditary material. Today we know. So come back in 100 years and maybe I'll have an answer to the origin of life question. But I may not, so what? Uh, that is the nature of science. It's not about final answers. You find final answers only in books that you find you know, in the National Enquirer uh, magazine, but not, not in science. All right, I solved the mystery. Science Magazine, Antarctic Journal, Science Magazine, uh, Geological Professional Paper, Geological Professional Paper, Natural History. Um, I, don't have, I don't have a quote for that one. The picture is from Reader's Digest. The quote is not. I keep track of where I get my pictures from. Okay. I try to document everything just so this type of thing doesn't happen. I never said any of these quotes are from Peter's Digest. No, I'm sorry, spontaneous generation. I know, but see, I gotta go back and defend myself, or he's gonna go and tell everybody I believe Superman makes diamonds, okay? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the picture was from Peter's Digest. Spontaneous generation doesn't happen. Evolutionists have to believe in it. He has no other choice. Because he doesn't want God to know what to do, I think, is the problem. What mechanism limits microevolution to keep it from working on a macroevolutionary level? What mechanism limits microevolution? Well, the Bible clearly says the animals will bring forth after their kind. The kinds, apparently, are those that originally were able to bring forth, reproduce. Now, they may have diversified to the point where they don't normally reproduce. Lions and tigers don't normally breed, but they might have got a common ancestor. They have been bred in captivity. A liger and a tiger have been produced, depending on which one is the father or the mother. Uh, even a dolphin and a whale, killer whale, went across, and they got a walpin. Uh, one of the zoo, I think San Diego Zoo or Hawaii Zoo, so one of them had the... Anyway, I think the mechanism is a genetic code that simply prevents them from crossing. For instance, humans have 46 chromosomes. Chimpanzees have 48. So does tobacco, by the way. It has 48. That proves tobacco and chimpanzees are identical twins. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to get bored on saying I believe that. I'm making a joke, folks, OK? I don't believe that. Uh, uh, I think if you read in my seminar notebook, I've got a chart showing the chromosome numbers of different various animals. It's kind of a spoof on uh, evolution, showing that it doesn't follow the predicted pattern. Uh, I think there is a, probably a DNA mechanism that prevents this uh, crossing of different kinds. That's designed into it. God said the rain forth after the kind. There's never been an exception to that. It's interesting that creationists will keep coming up with the word kind, which is not a biological term of any sort. Anytime that I ask the creationist to define exactly what does it mean by kind, I don't get an answer. 
Um, how many times were of Noah's Ark, for example? Um, what I guess? Probably about 10,000, I guess. 10,000. If that is true, from 10,000 times we got the several million species of, of organisms that are living today on Earth, you believe in a heck of a lot more evolution than I do. The distinction between micro and macro evolution is artificial. There is no distinction in the biological theory between micro and macro evolution. Macro evolution is simply micro evolution writ large over a very long period of time. There is no, no difference that, that anybody can figure out, and I still haven't had a creationist to be able to, to tell me what the difference actually is. Next question. If evolution is right, what is the purpose of life? I don't know. I'm not a, <laughs> I'm not a theologian, I'm not a philosopher. Well, I, I'm studying to become a philosopher, so maybe four years down the road I might give you some hint to that. I have no idea what the meaning of life is, and if you think you have an, an, an idea of what the meaning of life is, great. Uh, my personal and preferable and preferred answer is, is the movie from uh, Monty Martin. Um, that's, that's where I get it. <laughs> that is a joke. Don't quote me. I don't know that biologists are now in the business of giving the meaning of life. The meaning of life is a very serious thing that every single one of us has to look for by himself or herself. And if you want to do it within a religious framework, it's great. If you can find the meaning of life within that framework, I have no problem whatsoever. That doesn't uh, uh, have anything to do with evolutionary biologists. Evolutionary biologists, contrary to what persons think, don't go around teaching atheism and don't go around teaching the meaning of life. You've got nothing to do with it. Uh, to me, it'd be a good question because evolution isn't right. Uh, so you said if evolution is right, what's the meaning of life? If evolution isn't right, so the question is meaningless. I think there certainly is a meaning to life. I think God designed us to have fellowship with Him. I think we were made in His image, and then today, like an old coin in your pocket gets worn out, you know, you can probably see the image anymore. I think our image is a little, you know, worn out compared to what it used to be. Uh, not, some folks really don't resemble God at all. Uh, but that was, we were originally made in His image, and He designed us to have fellowship with Him. And I'd be glad to introduce you to him afterwards if you'd like to be Dr. Hill, what is the difference between empirical science and origin science? Empirical science deals with things that we can observe or test or measure or weigh uh, with the word empiricism, I believe. You can look it up in the dictionary, I don't have that with me now. But uh, origins really is outside the realm of science. Um, it's, it gets into the metaphysical. You have to believe in certain things. It's not observable or testable. You can't measure it or weigh it or prove it in the laboratory. So origins really has nothing to do with science and should not be involved in any science classes. They should be in religion classes. There are various theories, uh, religious theories of how the world got here. But that has nothing to do with science. So it's a shame that, that origins is mixed with science so much. You know, beer is often sold at football games. Beer has nothing to do with football. And origins is often put into science class, but origins is not part of science. You can tell the kids, here's the, you know, the biceps, the triceps, the deltoid, the flexors, the extenders, the radius, the ulna. And the kid says, how do we get here? Uh, we don't know. Let's just learn for the test. You, know, nothing, you, know, you don't have to get into origins because you're going to offend somebody. If you teach evolution, somebody's going to be offended. How many of you are offended when they teach evolution? Okay. If they talk creation in the schools, somebody would be offended. How many of you would be offended if they talk creation in the schools? See, it's a subject you can't please everybody, so leave it up to schools. How about if you have anything else about education in the school? That would make a lot of people very happy. The question uh, was the origin of the Right, it's not it's the great word. That distinction that we found as, as uh, just proposed is actually a fairly naive distinction from the point of view of science. Science doesn't work that in a, such a simple way. There are certain limits to what science can do, by, by all means, there's no question about it. But some